Greetings, fellow creatures. Um, so all we need to do is really to know a little bit of our history or to turn on the news every day to know that fanatically utopian social movements can be catastrophically destructive. Also, the utopian impulse can be embarrassingly silly when it's, when it's not grounded. That said, the utopian imagination is crucial to the human enterprise because it's the source of men, most of the new ideas and visions that human beings come up with. And I suspect that none of you would be here at Bioneers if you didn't think we needed some new ideas and new visions. Um, the, the literary realm that has explored um, the utopian imagination and possible scenarios for the human future um, the most creatively and dynamically for the last 150 years or so has been the realm of science fiction. Now, science fiction is beloved by large swaths of our population. You know, some of the most popular films of all time in the last few decades have been science fiction films. Not all of them very good, but that's another matter. Um, and unfortunately, uh, the realm of sci-fi does not get often the respect of the literary establishment or of the establishment period. Um, and that's really grossly unfair, especially when we're dealing with the highest exemplars of, of that genre. And um, our next speaker here, in my humble opinion, represents absolutely the highest octave of science fiction. He's someone who, in, in my opinion, is the most interesting, um, the most deeply informed, thanks to his wife, a chemist, the most scientifically literate, um, and very importantly here at Bioneers, the most eco and socially conscious of all contemporary science fiction writers. Um, he's written at last count, I, if my math is right, some 17 novels, a uh, number of short stories and um, nonfiction pieces. Um, his, his remarkable body of work includes the groundbreaking Southern California or Orange County Trilogy, which envisioned three possible futures for Southern California, including the Ecotopian um, uh, Pacific Edge. Also, two other trilogies, uh, the very famous Red Mars, Blue Mars, Green Mars, beloved of many NASA scientists, um, and, um, and one uh, prophetic one on climate change, the so-called 40, 50, 60 degree series. Um, and most recently, his most recent novel, Aurora, has been very well received by the critics. Um, but Stan, as, he, as we call him, is a, a very well-rounded fellow whose interests range far beyond science fiction. Um, he is a great champion. Well, he, at university, he studied with the renowned Marxist scholar Frederick Jameson, who was one of his mentors. And he has been a great advocate for the highly influential San Francisco poet and cultural figure Kenneth Rexroth, and has edited some of his work. Um, he, He's a great lover of the Sierra, like his buddy Gary Snyder. Um, he is an avid backpacker and a great defender of wilderness. Um, and he's no slouch in the family department. He lives in co-housing in Davis with his family. He's been a stay-at-home dad at times. And he's a dedicated Frisbee golf player. Basically, this is one cool dude, that, that's, that's in, in my opinion. Um, so Stan is not only about utopian scenarios. He can do realism and dystopian scenarios with the best of them. And, uh, dystopian scenarios are by far the more popular sci-fi tropes in the, uh, these days because our situation is so dire that that's what one would expect. And dystopian novels are easier to write than utopian ones for the same reason actors like, like to play villains rather than noble heroes. Um, but he's one of the few who's been unabashedly, few writers unabashedly willing to look at what a functional future would be like. And that's what he's going to talk to you about today, I think. In my view, for the utopian imagination to be productive, it has to be grounded in a sophisticated and deep understanding of reality. And no one is better qualified to do that than Stan. So I'd like you to help me greet one of the, the greatest science fiction, the greatest writers and thinkers of our time, in my opinion, and the most centered, grounded utopian I know, Kim Stanley Robinson. Thanks, JP, for that kind introduction, and it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, the sustainable and just civilization that we all hope to create, and it's really why we're here this morning, cannot be built using a capitalist economy. Now, it's good news and bad news. It's a little terrifying because capitalism is not just the law of the land, but the global order, and we're in it. It's the rule of law. It's massively entrenched and backed by the laws and army. So if you agree with what I've said, then it's right to be a little terrified. Um, 
the economics as a, uh, a study of the capitalist system, which is mainly what it is, is very proud of its cumulative equilibrium, which is the, basically the, the grand total of all the um, uh, supply and demand questions being made in the market and decided by the market. But it's a deal between buyers and sellers in which um, everything is always underpriced. The uh, buyers are in a bind because they need to uh, compete with all the other, um, uh, um, they need to get what they need. The sellers are in a bind because they are competing with all the other sellers and so they price things as low as they can so that they don't go out of business. And in fact, they price things for lower than they cost to make. Now this looks like a uh, recipe for bankruptcy and many businesses do go bankrupt. But um, they get away with it by ignoring some of the costs that they've incurred and by shoving other costs onto the future. So um, because uh, labor, which really means people, can also be bought at the cheapest uh, amount available in the world market, um, the result is that uh, the sellers are selling things for less than it costs to make, buyers are buying them for less than they cost to make, and in a sense, there's a collusion between buyers and sellers to say, look, let's just do this, and the hidden costs, the deferred costs, the denied costs, the externalities will be shoved onto um, future generations. So it, normally what that would be called is a, a Ponzi scheme, and it's a, it's a little bit funny to think that the world economy would be illegal if it was run this year in the state of California, but it's not that funny because we're in it and it's the law everywhere. So we are stealing from the future by way of a multi-generational Ponzi scheme, and every year we uh, overuse the natural resources of the planet in terms of what they can replenish at about August of every year. So we're in the overshoot of, of this year already by a good month or two. And that, as that goes on, the, the whole biosphere gets degraded, and yet there is no cost by that. So um, the people who are fooled by a Ponzi scheme uh, do not get their money back. And the people who are uh, fooled by this Ponzi scheme, who are not even born yet, some of them, are not going to get their planet back. So this is serious because it's not just a loss of your finances, you, it's a loss of your bioinfrastructure. And I just want to very quickly rehearse one aspect of it. The, um, the planetary collapse, the sort of Bernie Madoff moment, where if everybody on the planet were to live at Western levels of consumption, um, you would need two or three planets to support it. So we're in a crash. Um, is, is taking the form of a mass extinction event. There's violent um, climate change, and there's also ocean acidification, which could kill the life in the oceans. And then it's quite possible that sea level could rise very rapidly. The last time we were in these climactic conditions in the Eocene, um, uh, sea level rose like 15 feet in a single century, and it isn't quite clear why that happened, but it's uh, pretty obvious that it's the ice masses in Antarctica and Greenland that caused it. So what we can quickly wrap up, and I want to actually put it in numbers, is we can burn about 500 more gigatons of carbon uh, before we have, in, a, in essence, cooked the planet and tipped it over into a, a, a degraded world that will be very difficult for human communities to live in. Um, and yet, we have already located and identified 2,500 gigatons of fossil carbon that's in the ground of the world. Now, um, companies have listed all 2,500 uh, gigatons of that carbon as uh, assets, and nations have listed them as national resources, offshore or onshore. So there will be uh, corporate leaders and political leaders that will be trying to burn that carbon um, that they own before the unburned carbon becomes what they would call in economic terms stranded assets. And the monetary value of the 2,000 gigatons of carbon that you can't burn, I recently calculated to be at current prices about $160 trillion. Now, this is a completely artificial number because it's like trying to calculate the monetary value of a poison. I mean, you do have to pay money to buy a poison if you need it, but as the poison is administered to the patient and it begins to die, naturally the monetary value of the substance will change over time. But $160 trillion is a lot of money. 
And there are going to be people, well-meaning people, who out of fiduciary responsibility or out of a feeling of responsibility to their constituents as politicians, that are gonna be trying to burn their trillion or two of that carbon and then hope that other people can cope with the problems that are created later on in the process. So there are going to be well-meaning people trying to burn all that carbon for the entirety of this century. And it, so what it implies is there's gonna be an absolutely huge political battle. Now, having described this rather terrifying situation, I think it's very important to point out right now that actually we are also in the position to have the technical capacity, we have the technical capacity, we have the social skills and the knowledge to create a sustainable and just civilization for all seven billion people on the planet and all the rest of the biosphere's living creatures, including the large mammals that are most endangered. The, it's, it's not fantasy to say so. It's really kind of a, 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 a extrapolation of already existing things that we know. So that being the case, the technology really is not the hard part. It's already invented, but we have to pay ourselves to install it fast. So again, that's an economic question, and it doesn't work in capitalism. We can arrange also for everybody alive today to have food, water, shelter, clothing, education, and health care. Adequacy itself, which is a very great thing, uh, because uh, one of the oldest phrases in the English language, enough is as good as a feast, is a very true uh, phrase, and in fact, enough is even better than a feast, because feasting makes you sick. So um, we can fit adequacy within the biosphere's carrying capacity, no problem. And even within the capitalist system, the UN has done an incredible job with its millennial project in raising the poorest people on the planet that are most immiserated, um, about a billion of them have gotten to at least the next step up in the last uh, 10 or 15 years. But this was not a capitalist accomplishment. This was aid, this was in effect charity, it was using the surplus and, and, and doing uh, work that is not paid for in the usual profit system. But what's interesting is that's proof of concept that it could be done. So um, again, it's an economic problem, it's a political problem. And lastly, people often say, well, there's too many people on the planet, and this is an open question. We don't really know, but one thing's for sure. Wherever women have their full set of legal rights, the population growth rate immediately stabilizes, flattens, and sometimes even drops down. So, um, <laughs> it's tremendous that social justice is also uh, environmentally and survival, in survival terms, useful. It's not a bad thing that you have to talk about usefulness to support an obvious moral point. The two of them strengthen each other and strand together so that you can talk about um, uh, hyperconsumption and, and deep poverty as being the worst environmental impacts and therefore we need to solve in inequality, not just because it's the right thing to do, but also because it's the survivable thing to do. That's something to celebrate rather than to worry about. Um, Next spring, E.O. Wilson will publish a book in which he suggests that we occupy only half of the Earth's surface. It's called Half Earth. It's going to be an interesting thing because, uh, because rapid urbanization is already collecting people into rather tight knots around the planet, the process has already begun. If half of the land surface of the Earth was given back to wilderness, or you can, it's best maybe to call it parks or at least unoccupied or non-human spaces, habitat corridors could be built and the rest of the mammals and the rest of the living things on the planet could prosper in that. Nothing is final but extinction. And it, um, so uh, there's a, life is robust and if we were to create this system in an orderly fashion as quick as we can, it's again part of the solution. Um, the wild creatures, if they have prosperity, that's our prosperity. So uh, uh, the, this plan of Wilson's uh, could be, make a sustainable world for all the living creatures. And in short, this is a utopian vision. And I'm very happy to think of E.O. Wilson becoming a utopian science fiction writer. Um, he's often kind of dismissed science fiction before in his writings as the thing that isn't real, but now he's doing it himself. Uh, and it's a, I'm happy to welcome him. It's a very good crowd that he's joining. So, 
Um, you can describe a utopian situation that is realistic given our technology, our social skills, and the, the uh, physical resources of the whole biological community of Earth. But we're also in this situation right now. And it's a very peculiar moment in history because the disastrous future, the dystopia, is quite possible and we're uh, in many ways on course to it. Uh, if we continue to do what we're doing now, we're headed that way. On the other hand, the possibility for utopia is also there. We are powerful uh, thinkers on this planet, and we can think our way out of this one uh, and, and it, by using the technology that's called language, rule of law, and justice. These are technologies. These are the technical solution. Because a technology is, is a software as well as a hardware. It isn't just machinery. It's really the way that we organize our relationship to the physical world. That's technology. We've been technological since before we were even human. Uh, Pre-humans were using stones and fire to get along in this world, and probably clothing. So there's no problem with technology as long as it's understood right as a force for good. But I've often thought that you get a vision of, of a distant utopia and you see the situation that we're in now and the question becomes, what do you do right now to bridge? What is the steps that you take in the present that get you to this positive future that you can imagine rather easily? Uh, and so you also have to keep in mind that the solution is going to take decades. It's going to take generations and you can't let that discourage you. You take the steps that are necessary now. It's a scaffolding theory like a coral reef. You build the scaffold at the level that you can in the situation that you're faced with, and then hope that that is a, raises the level of discourse and activity so that the next generation can take over at a somewhat higher level of interaction with the planet. So um, it's not going to happen immediately, but what do we do right now? Um, so first, anti-austerity. Austerity is exactly wrong and is merely increasing the power of the oligarchy on this planet to continue their destructive ways. So it's not a good plan. And what, uh, what, us, what is anti-austerity actively opposing it is actually um, supporting government in its representation of the people rather than of the oligarchs. So government is a tool, but it's also a battleground where we're fighting over these ideas. And the, but the Keynesian idea that government imposes on business, imposes its will by way of laws on business, is one that was abandoned for about 30 years of the 1980 till, till 2008. But ever since 2008, it has been shown that that plan of privatizing everything is actually a road to disaster. And now the, the first step is just Keynesianism as over austerity. Um, what that means, in effect, in details, is a carbon tax, of course, that rises over time on a regular rate. It's, it's obvious and necessary. Uh, secondly, there should be a high-frequency trading tax so that every time there's a million trades per second, if a mill of that or a point of that is going into the public coffers, then even though there is a basic stupidity to finance, at least it would be funding the public good. Um, a living wage for all could be made out of that kind of, of uh, uh, coffers uh, being uh, bulked up, and a living wage for all uh, reduces the impact on the planet and creates sustainability and well-being. So this is another obvious idea. And then lastly, and I think very powerfully, uh, Thomas Piketty, his book of a couple years ago, suggests that, that not only there should be progressive taxation, as in the New Deal and the post-war period, not just on income, but on capital assets. Because income can be shuffled under, this, under the rug and hidden, but capital assets cannot be hidden, and a progressive tax, uh, uh, sharply progressive on capital, ac capital assets, would be one of the greatest horizontalizations of wealth and, uh, and uh, for the public good uh, since um, FDR's GI Bill. And it might be even more transformative than that, because what all these things together are leading to is, in effect, a kind of uh, social democracy, a version of social democracy, like we see in Scandinavia, but even more so. So when you, when you organize what we do now into political platforms and steps, you get something that's already being done on the planet that makes sense, and it can be discussed. Since 2008, the window of acceptable discourse, what people can talk about in America without being immediately disregarded as a, say, a science fiction writer from Mars, um, um, would, has 
shifted markedly to the left, and we even have a, a socialist running for president and polling very well. So all these together, in a social democracy, you, you would then be going on to something else that you could only call at this point post-capitalism. The, the market will always exist because we need to trade, but it could be so sharply regulated that it could exist in what economists call the margin. The market on the margin for the toys, for the, not for the necessities of life, which should all be public utilities and part of a living wage, but just for the extras. Um, there, if people want to uh, play that game, then it would be like, you know, playing rugby or tackle football or anything that's, you know, kind of testosterone fueled, but uh, exciting for those of, who like it. That's what capitalism should be at the, in the post-capitalism world. It's also important to point out that it needs to be global. And it, never should we be fighting, first you shouldn't be fighting government because government is really the people's company. And secondly, you shouldn't be fighting globalization because unless this whole system is global and enforced by the World Trade Organization and by international treaty, then bad actors can simply move their capital assets elsewhere. And although America is by far the largest agglomeration in capital on this planet still, far out uh, reaching, for instance, China and the European Union. Uh, if, in other words, if things happen in the United States, it will lead the way, just the way that California tends to lead the United States. So uh, it would be good if you do it at the national level, but you also want it on the global level to get rid of tax havens and flags of convenience so nobody can skip out on this system. In other words, a global system is good if the rules are good and a global system is bad if the rules are bad. Right now, the rules are bad. They can be changed because they're laws and treaties, and laws and treaties can be changed. Um, it's true that you c this fight of changing the laws is most powerful on the local and the national levels because that's where people have the most control of the laws, and it's really at the international level where the technocrats of Davos have taken over. But they, too, are responsive to uh, people power. And so we can work on it at all three levels, but it, the, you should never demonize the global level because it needs to be a world system. Um, so what I'm saying here, and I'm really going to wrap it up, is that this is a political fight. It's not going to go away in the entirety of this century. Everybody alive here is going to be involved in this fight for the entirety of their lives. So you have to pace yourself for the long haul. You have to have a lot of faith in the young people to come in and throw in mega hours into the battle so that the, um, it's, it's like a wave attack where wave after wave has to go out there and sacrifice many hours of their life to uh, stupid small meetings in order to make change. And yet, um, it's how change happens. Um, the greatest American utopian science fiction story is this one. Uh, that government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from this earth. Shall not makes it a future tense and an imperative. It's a science fiction story. It's a utopian story. What Lincoln was saying to us was an injunction and even a command. Democracy only exists when people go out and make it happen, especially when there are very powerful forces with a lot of money trying to buy up that very same government that we call democratic. So um, in this in this battle, we have to um, settle in for the long haul and think of it as things that can be done in the day-to-day -day as political platforms and daily activity that also sees the long-term horizon of a planet where we actually are in balance with the natural forces and can make it work. And since it is possible, then we need to do it. It's sort of a matter of responsibility to the children and the people not yet born. So it's great to see a crowd. Here we are. We're in California. We're in Marin County. It's kind of the epicenter for um, a progressive vision like this. It's a utopian space itself and has been all along. So a great pleasure to speak to you all. And um, I look forward to the rest of the afternoon talking to everybody. Thank you.